everyone. Um, my name is Tara Beattie. I'm a lecturer in social epidemiology at LSHTM and I'm a member of the STRIVE team. My research is primarily with female sex workers and adolescent girls in South India. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, um, STRIVE is a six-year international research consortium investigating the social norms and inequalities that drive HIV. STRIVE partners investigate how structural factors create vulnerability and what programs work to tackle them. So our research focuses on key upstream determinants, including gender inequality and violence, poor livelihood options, alcohol availability and drinking norms, and stigma and criminalization. And in May of this year, STRIVE hosted a high-level consultation at, called Green Tree 2 on the association between violence against women and girls and HIV in New York. The meeting was held in New York. The, re the, uh, the consultation was against um, looking at violence against women and girls and HIV um, globally. The consultation involved researchers, including myself and Michelle Decker, as well as those best placed to take this evidence and analysis into policy and practice, such as WHO, UNAIDS, PEPFAR, and the US NIH. And we're looking forward to sharing outputs from this excellent gathering in the coming months, beginning with this learning lab. So this webinar, and the title of this webinar, is Violence and Structural HIV Risk to Sex Workers. Sex workers are a key risk population for HIV. International recognition of the structural drivers of their risk, including gender-based violence, is mounting. This webinar gives us the opportunity to learn more about the prevalence and health impact of violence among sex workers to understand the, the unique ways in which violence, its health impact and access to justice are experienced in this population, and to discuss ways to incorporate prevention and support within HIV programming, even where sex work is criminalized. So um, the webinar will be presented by Dr. Michelle Decker. She's an Associate Professor of Population, Family and Reproductive Health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health where she directs the Women's Health and Rights Programme of the Centre for Public Health and Human Rights. Her research areas include gender-based violence and other structural determinants of HIV risk and sexual and reproductive health among adolescents and young adult women. A social epidemiologist by training, her research focuses on gender-based gender violence, its prevention and its implications for sexual and reproductive health. Much of this work involves marginalised populations, including urban women, adolescents, and those involved in transactional sex or sex work. Michelle works in the United States as well as in Asia and Eastern Europe. So um, over to you men then, Michelle, for um, your webinar. Great. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Tara, for that great introduction. And thanks to Strive for, for really hosting this and leading these learning labs, I think the series has been so valuable for all of us working in um, these areas of structural drivers of HIV. Um, okay, so here we go. So you, you heard a little bit about me. Um, I'm really thrilled to share with you today about sex workers, some of what we're learning about violence and structural HIV risk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit um, about, we're, we're going to be talking today specifically about sex workers. We know that many are in the sex industry under conditions of force or fraud or coercion. Here today we're going to speak specifically about those who are um, in sex work as adults, um, hopefully, and um, under non-exploitative circumstances. Just to give you a sense of some of the policy um, context around all of that, we're talking specifically about sex workers today. Um, and I'm going to be sharing with you some of my work from um, the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, as well as some of the other great work that's been happening, including some wonderful work by Tara. Um, in, um, in India on this topic. So our goals today are to talk really about the prevalence and the health impact of violence affecting sex workers, some of the things that are unique for this population, some of the things that are shared with other general populations when we think about violence and HIV risk. We'll talk about the ways that violence and health impacts and um, really access to justice are experienced in this population. And we'll talk about ways that we can incorporate prevention and support within HIV programming, even where sex work is criminalized. Um, and at the very end, we'll talk about some of the relevant policy contexts for understanding HIV and sex work and violence and how these things come together. So briefly, just to give you a context on this, um, historically, our public health focus on sex workers has been longstanding, right? and largely from an infectious disease standpoint. We can look back to the 1800s and see 
estimates of syphilis and sexually transmitted infections among women of ill repute or all kinds of other sort of pseudonyms for what we would call today um, sex work. Even today, we see that sex workers suffer a disproportionate HIV burden. It's about 11 times that of women of reproductive age in general populations. And we're seeing really a growing recognition, and I would say a rapidly growing recognition of violence against women in sex work, often with very significant HIV implications. So this has started to take shape. Um, you can see WHO publications from 2005, 2008 on this topic. They convened a first meeting on best practices on responding to GBV for sex workers specifically in 2013. So this is really taking shape and building momentum, I would say, um, as we're bringing the evidence together, but also the practice community around this topic. So high risk and underserved. To sort of summarize this, th these issues in, in one slide, we see that women who trade sex, and this could be for drugs, money, resources, or safety, are at incredibly high risk for physical and sexual violence. They experience abuse from a range of perpetrators, so intimate partners, but also clients, pimps or managers, and police. We see that entry to sex work as minors under the age of 18 is pretty common, um, up to about a third, depending on the setting. Um, and self-reported forced fraud or coercion is less common, but the needs in this population, again, are great. Um, we won't focus on that specifically today, but I, I do want to make, sure, make you aware of some of what we know about those that are coming into sex work under other um, circumstances. One of the interesting things about what we see about violence and STI and HIV risk and infection is that it's very similar to the patterns that we see in the general population. So we've seen, as you know, evidence over the past 20 years linking violence um, with sexual risk behavior and STI and HIV in the general population, many of those same patterns are applying to this population of sex workers as well. Some of the differences are as well that we see, unfortunately, a real systems failure. We see that sex workers really slip through the cracks of violence prevention and support for a variety of reasons. Let's talk about that. Um, we see that the criminal justice system for this population fails to protect sex workers and in many cases actually perpetrates harm. We see that social stigma and added layers of self-blame, isolation, and the criminalization of sex work really contribute to this climate of impunity. So let's take a look at some of the estimates um, that have come out from various places in the world. These are just a couple of examples of the global data on recent physical or sexual violence um, against sex workers. You can see the sample sizes and the settings on the left here, um, and you can see the estimates in the graph um, for, these, for these various forms of abuse. Um, overall, these are in the, you know, somewhere in the 30% range up to over 75% um, of sex workers in Moscow um, had reported recent physical violence. So these estimates are really staggering. When we think that about one in three women in her lifetime will experience physical or sexual violence, and those are from the WHO reports, here we see that the, the level and the intensity of abuse against sex workers um, is, similar, is similar to that in many settings, um, if not much higher. And this is abuse that has happened recently, so past six months or past year. So this is an, a, an example of just how extensive this abuse is. One of the things that's really um, important for us to remember about sex workers and what makes their experience unique, again, is that we see clients really as a dominant perpetrator of violence against sex workers. We also see pimps, managers, sometimes they're called boys or brothel owners, it depends on the setting. These are also individuals that are supposedly providing some level of protection, but in some cases actually really perpetrating abuse against this population. We also see that police are perpetrating violence, oftentimes harass, certainly harassment, um, interference in their safety activities, but in some cases as well, physical and sexual violence. Something that is shared in this population with other populations is that they experience abuse as well from non-paying intimate partners, what we would call intimate partner violence or domestic violence. So in the same way that we see this in the general population, we also see it intimate partner violence against sex workers in addition to some of the other violence that is that is being faced. Why am I highlighting this? Um, in part because 
So the work that we've done so far in the epidemiology often has sort of grouped these perpetrators together. and We've asked women, have you experienced any physical or sexual violence, or we've used some of our best practices there. It's really important for us to tease out who is actually perpetrating abuse in this population, whether it's for our research or for practice purposes. Because the interventions are going to differ, whether we're trying to address client violence or intimate partner violence, the context in those interventions may really differ. So this is why it's important to know that this is a real range of perpetrators that we see in this population. One of the other things that is unique um, and important to understand about sex workers is that they have some added layers of stigma and self-blame in their experiences of violence. So we know globally from WHO data, from all a whole range of data sources that most who experience violence never share their experiences. They're silenced by their own fears, their own sense of stigma, shame, or self-blame. We know that those who do share their experiences are very often blamed for the, the abuse that they experience. And this is true for sex workers as well. In addition, an added layer of stigma and self-blame, we see that there are pervasive myths that sex workers cannot be raped. Right, that because of the, the nature of the work they're involved in, because they're having sex with multiple individuals, they have um, somehow released their um, ability to be raped. And this is, of course, not true, right? But it's something that's out there among police, and it is actually oftentimes pervasive among the women that we work with as well. When we talk to sex workers, and this is in many settings, they tell us, no one has ever asked me about abuse. So this is in, in populations where people are coming in for HIV testing and treatment and care, all kinds of support or prevention services focused on HIV, and they're telling us, no one's ever asked me about violence. Um, so this is uh, part of this idea that maybe this violence is in a separate place for them than um, some other HIV risk. And what we're talking about today is the ways that these really very much come together. Some other areas of stigma and self-blame really stem from this idea that sex workers are blamed for who they are and what they do, um, and that they somehow, because of their involvement in sex work, don't have the right to not be free from violence. And of course, this is not true. Um, this is reinforced by the social climate and the policy climate of criminalization in many places. So as we're working with victims, whether we're, um, and sex workers, whether we're doing research or practice, knowing that, first of all, their levels of violence are extraordinarily high. Secondly, they're subject to the same issues around sharing and self-blame that we see in more general populations. And finally, they have these added layers of stigma and self-blame around these experiences of violence. Really important for us as we're thinking about providing trauma-informed care and being responsive to these issues if we're doing research in this, these populations. So we'll talk a little bit as well about how does violence relate to HIV risk, infection, and care. And again, these are similar. These are going to sound familiar for those of you that are working in this area in more general populations. So we see certainly that sexual violence is absolutely a context for HIV transmission. This is going to vary across epidemic um, stages. Um, we also see these indirect pathways where violence and fear of abuse can undermine condom use and ability to negotiate sex. I'll share, share some data around that as well. Um, and we know in general populations that violence perpetrators are more likely to engage in sexual risk and be HIV infected. We haven't done a lot of work with clients of sex workers. Um, that's a really important area for innovation um, and to understand who these patterns hold as well for clients of sex workers. Violence can also disrupt HIV testing, disclosure, and care. Um, and we're starting to see this isn't specific to sex workers yet, but in more general populations, we see that violence and other traumatic life events are associated with lower adherence to antiretroviral therapy and a poor viral response. So there's some concern that, especially for those that are affected by sex work and uh, GBV, these issues may really um, come together to create poor HIV outcomes um, for those that are exper experiencing violence. So I'll share a couple of quotes from some of our work and some examples of really the disparity that we see in STI and HIV infection um, based on experiences of violence. These quotes here illustrate the links of violence and HIV risk for sex workers. And you can see a couple of things on the left. 
So this sex worker um, from Russia says, sometimes she pulls a condom on, she pulls it off right away, she puts it on again, and he can give me a punch for that. Um, so this is very much a context for uh, violence, is the sexual negotiation, negotiation of protection. Really concerning is um, this next quote that says, she's telling her client she doesn't practice anal sex, and he says, that's okay, he doesn't need it. But then when she goes with him, he starts beating her to make, uh, make her do what he wants. And given what we know about the transmission efficiency of anal intercourse in particular, this is especially concerning um, for the population of sex workers particularly. On the right-hand side, we see the differences in um, STI prevalence based on experiences of violence. So we see that among those that had experienced abuse in this sample, just over 35% were um, had an STI infection relative to only 15% of those that hadn't experienced violence. So this is about a threefold increased risk. We see similar patterns, and this is a larger sample of sex workers in Russia, um, where we're looking at recent client violence and HIV infection. Um, and for those that had experienced sexual violence as well as physical violence, this disparity in infection was tremendous. This is all cross-sectional data. It's possible that some of the um, violence that they experienced was perhaps in the context of, of HIV disclosure or something. We don't really know the timing of this, but this is really telling us that there is a, a tremendous pattern where those that are HIV infected are much more likely to be experiencing violence um, and, and vice versa. So let's think a little bit as well about some of these broader contextual pieces around stigma, marginalization, and criminalization. How do these perpetuate risk? This is uh, uh, some data from uh, sex workers. We're doing some work in Cameroon right now with key populations. And these are some of the examples that we heard from sex workers there, um, published by our student Sana Lim uh, recently, just earlier this year. So this context of criminalization and also marginalization really perpetuates risk for this population. Here you see that the police abuse us, she says, because we're not even people or that we're animals. And this is the basis on which they are being brutalized, condom confiscation. And and then on top of this, the police are coming back for sex without a condom, unprotected sex, obviously perpetuating risk in this context. This context of stigma and marginalization also really undermines accountability for gender-based violence. So this woman is explaining if a man rapes you, ultimately, we are prostitutes. We are a world apart. When we go to police, you will not be right. We don't have the support. They say that we are not people. So for those of us that are working to um, ensure access, access to justice and health for survivors of violence, this is really alarming, and it really breaks our hearts that given the experiences that people have, they're not able to access the justice system because of the criminalization and also this broader context of stigma and marginalization. So these are all sort of coming together to create really a context of impunity. Clients know this. Perpetrators of violence know that women have, that are involved in sex work really have no recourse, and that allows them to continue to perpetrate violence with impunity. Um, this is an example of um, broader dimensions of police harassment and abuse. This is from some of our uh, Russia experience. So, and this is illustrating really the extortion um, and the harassment elements as well, and we've seen this around the globe, that police will offer to not arrest somebody if she provides sex. Um, in some cases, there could be, you know, multiple police in the car that she's responsible then for, um, for servicing. And women will describe this not so much as rape, but um, as trading their, trading their freedom. They're, they describe it often as trading their freedom. Often, uh, this woman goes on to explain that often that they um, often they uh, refuse and ask to bring to the police office. They may draw up a report um, that says you're a drug user, um, and some girls, of course, agree to service them all in order to avoid it all. So you can see that in this broader context, there's very limited recourse to report violence um, and certainly to have any negotiation capacity around condom, condom protective sex or even um, sexual negotiation. So again, the social stigma issue, the criminalization of sex work, again, prompts law enforcement failure to protect. These are a couple of um, quotes from our uh, women here in the Baltimore area in the United States. And these really illustrate even more concretely this 
barrier to accessing justice. Someone described, I've been raped, and the police told me, you shouldn't be out there. You got what you deserved, right? Some pol police say that it's, it's, it's your fault. You should have given up this life a long time ago. So these tell us the messages that women are hearing, and they start to believe them. They start to really embody these messages and believe them, and that reduces their negotiation capacity around um, handling or anticipating violent clients as well as negotiating safe sex in the context of sex work. Also really concerning for us um, are these gaps in the support, um, support resources and the response um, for violence for this population. Women that are involved in sex work tell us a lot about their unmet needs for violence support. This is an example from Cameroon where she says, I wish there were follow-up clinics and support groups so that we could have a close place where we could go when we have a problem. So this lack of infrastructure for sex workers around the issues of violence is really perpetuating this problem. Women will tell us that this violence and self-blame are very common. This woman says, I told friends that I know, and they tell me, I need to stop being out there. It's not safe. Um, so this is shutting down her ability to really seek help um, and talk about these experiences. And many rationalize violence, again, as a risk of doing business, in part because they're hearing these messages from everyone around them, whether it's peers, police, or anyone else. This woman explains, well, it's part of the game. I don't know. I roll with the punches. If you're going to be in the game, you've got to be realistic about it. So this is, again, reflecting this context that tells tell sex workers that they don't have the right to really be free from violence. So moving on to some of, um, a, a, at a much broader level, we did a little bit of modeling um, a couple of years ago to really try to understand what would the epidemic impact be if we could reduce violence against sex workers? Um, so we had an opportunity to do this in two places. Ukraine, um, a more concentrated epidemic, and Kenya, a more generalized epidemic. And we took sort of the status quo of violence prevalence in each of these settings and reduced them to a couple of different levels to see if we could reduce violence, what would happen in terms of new infections. We adjusted for um, things like antiretroviral scale-up, um, as well as prevention, um, other kinds of prevention measures. And uh, interestingly, I think our, our team thought that that would really swamp any effects that we would see from reducing violence in this population. But what we did find was about a 25% reduction in new infections in both of these settings, even with this ART scale-up. The um, absolute number of infections averted uh, in each of these settings varied, of course, um, 4,500 4, in Ukraine and 18,000 in Kenya over a five-year period, obviously based on the epidemic dynamics um, in these underlying settings. But this tells us that investing in violence prevention for sex workers yields dividends, not only in health and well-being um, and safety, but, in, in, but truly as well in our HIV epidemic that we're seeing in these, in these settings. So let's talk a little bit about how we can get there. Some of that guidance on um, comprehensive GBV responses for key populations is really just emerging. Um, so you can see here, there are a couple of resources that I've highlighted. And this Venn diagram is really illustrating that we can draw on some of the evidence and some of the guidelines on GBV for general populations, kind of merge that together with some of the things that we're starting to see for key populations. Um, of course, we have the sex worker implementation tool that has a whole chapter on violence prevention, um, and we're starting to see some summaries of the literature and summaries of promising practices come out from USAID and WHO as well. Some of the guidance that we've seen from for general populations is very, very relevant. This is where we've articulated what needs to be together um, for a comprehensive response um, in terms of health. Um, SCI testing, SCI prophylaxis, emergency contraception. Some of those um, medical guidelines in particular are very, very relevant for key populations and sex workers. So I urge us to really bring these two bodies of work together um, for this population. This is um, what I thought was a really nice um, multi-level model uh, uh, for responding to gender-based violence for specific to key populations. And this really illustrates um, what we can be doing at the individual level um, in that innermost circle, raising awareness, building capacity of key populations and peer educators to address GBV. 
more broadly at the community level. It's facilitating dialogue specifically around police, but also local leaders around violence. And also stigma, as you saw from those quotes, these are some of the tremendous needs in terms of community response norms and stigma against sexual, um, sexual minorities um, as well as sex workers. Broadening out to the health and social system, wanting, wanting our sex workers who experience violence to be able to access care in the same way that other individuals can, hopefully, access care, um, is really mainstreaming um, some of the referral systems to be key population inclusive. So making sure that our rape crisis, domestic violence programs, have an ability to respond to sex workers and their violence issues. We haven't seen that historically happening. That's a way for us to use oftentimes existing infrastructure to expand and meet the needs of this population. And finally, getting to the environment level, we'll talk about policy in just a bit, um, really advocating um, against structural barriers to action on GBV and advocating for policies that are enabling for our key populations um, rather than constraining for them. So we'll talk next about what works, um, and I see a couple of questions here. I'm just going to take a pause to, to respond to a couple of questions. Um, we'll talk, thank you, about sort of raising this question about illegal sex work versus um, the legal context of sex work. We'll talk about that policy climate um, in just a minute. And in terms of some of these promising practices, many of these have been implemented and tested in places where sex work is heavily criminalized. So first, um, I'll share, this is really uh, an example that is very much underway, and this is trauma-informed care that is integrated into HIV outreach. So historic, we have a vast infrastructure of peer education um, around the world for sex workers and other marginalized populations. Historically, we haven't really used this um, in the way that we could to reach sex workers around violence messaging. That's going to change a little bit with the introduction of the sex worker implementation tool. Um, <clears throat> but um, historically, we haven't done a lot of this. So can we reach sex workers with messages around safety and GBV-related support? Can we use this system to support the referrals to health and social services around violence? Um, so we've done, um, actually here in Baltimore, a community-based participatory process, and we have a feasibility trial um, underway that's really worked to train outreach workers um, in trauma-informed care, in connection, connection to services um, for sex workers. Anecdotally, we're hearing um, very positive feedback, and um, we'll hopefully get a chance to share with you some of the um, quantitative findings uh, next time we have a chance to connect. But this is this is a model for what we may be able to do, leveraging an existing in, in infrastructure. I'll share with you briefly, um, this is just a, a safety card that we've developed um, as part of peer outreach. Uh, again, drawing on the experiences of sex workers, as well as those actually that have been trafficked into sex work, trying to facilitate those referrals. This is actually just one side of our card, um, but you can get a sense around it. Um, around trying to provide some safety tips and also normalizing getting support for violence, providing those local resources, whether they are for sex work support groups as well as domestic violence and, and rape crisis programs. Because many sex workers are really just simply either they're unaware of these services or they believe that, that they're not for them because they're involved in sex work, sex work. So we're trying to really overcome some of those barriers. A couple of other promising practices. Um, this is an example that came out of Mongolia recently. This is really showing us the value of support and peer networks, social support and peer networks. Um, this is a great example. Uh, these groups, they recruited women uh, that were trading sex into um, sort of support groups, and they randomized uh, these groups to whether they were going to receive violence-specific messaging versus general HIV prevention. Interestingly enough, these groups reduced physical and sexual violence among sex workers regardless of what was discussed. So this tells us a little bit about the value of overcoming isolation for sex workers, how this can buffer against physical and sexual violence victimization. A couple of other um, promising practices, police and legal advocacy. This is such a powerful example. This is the Women's Legal Center, which provides workshops on human rights and police and legal advocacy. Sort of a cornerstone of sex worker rights has been 
hosting, um, human rights promotion, and dialogue. The piece that is really exciting and innovative about this is police and the police and legal advocacy, um, where sex workers are actually trained as paralegals to provide legal information, advice, and also assistance with court hearings and complaints about police abuse. So this allows sex workers to have some leverage in these conversations so that they're not showing up to the police office by themselves, but rather with somebody that's going to help them advocate. And so this is a great example. This, this is happening even where sex work is heavily criminalized. So this tells us that starting the dialogue with police and providing that advocacy can really buffer against this, can really help to change this environment. Um, and finally, I'll highlight, um, um, and thank you, Tara Beatty, for this wonderful work. This is so exciting. Um, this was a comprehensive response to, um, to violence um, in Karnataka. And this, this blended police advocacy, police training, media sensitization, so critical, as well as sex worker mobilization with drop-in centers, literacy training, and empowerment. Um, and this was found to really reduce violence against sex workers. So this is really exciting, and it tells us that addressing all of these elements in something that is kind of a combination approach can really um, offer some value in violence prevention. Obviously, this is a big undertaking, um, and many of our groups will be starting perhaps at one or two levels, um, and so that's kind of why I illustrate some of the promising practices that we see across various levels of this broader combination program. But it is really important to know that when we put these pieces together, we see tremendous reductions in violence, and this is really exciting. So what about the macro policy context? Just shifting us way back out in response to um, some of the questions and the things that may be on your mind about um, legal, uh, legal versus criminalized context for sex work. So globally, uh, the vast, the vast majority of the policy contexts out there in the world are ones of criminalization, and so this would be prohibitions on selling sex, on buying sex, on related activities. Some places this may criminalize only the buying or only the selling. Um, it may criminalize third parties. It may criminalize um, people that are operating houses of prostitution and so forth. So this can take a lot of different forms, but the bottom line is that this is criminalized. Um, it, and truly, this actually gives um, really gives cover, as you've seen from the quotes from the women, as well as from um, um, uh, when they're accessing services, as well as trying to access police care, that this really gives cover for widespread abuse and discrimination, right? Even when these laws are lawfully applied, the punitive laws it really do impede health and safety, right? They make it such that sex workers cannot come forward for police reporting, for example, for fear of being criminalized themselves. The other thing that is really important for us to understand is that a lot of the abuse that is perpetrated by police in these criminalized contexts, it's well beyond the letter of the law. So the fact of criminalizing sex work gives gives rise to, gives cover to police perpetrating all kinds of other abuse. So nowhere in the world is police sexual violence against sex workers um, legal, right? Nowhere in the world is that legal or a best practice for police. However, the fact that these, this population is criminalized allows this to happen with impunity. So this tells us something very important, which is that reform to police practice and access to justice is really important even in these criminalized settings, and I would say perhaps most importantly in these criminalized settings. And this is what we're seeing when we look to examples um, like the one that I shared around South Africa, some of the work that has started in Poland around police advocacy, working with police to make sure that even where sex work is criminalized, this population still has access to police to report, for example, and obtain access to justice for crimes that are perpetrated against them. A lot of work can happen in this area, even, even in the short term. Of course, many are advocating for decriminalization um, as a response to sex work for a whole variety of reasons. That work is very important, and that is a long road. Um, there is a lot of work that can be done to support this population while we're working for broader um, social change. I'll also mention that partial criminalization creates harms. A lot of us have heard about some of the um, – sort of the so-called Nordic model of criminalizing buyers rather than um, sex workers themselves. 
The jury is still out on that. We haven't seen necessarily exactly how this is working. Anecdotally, in some of the um, some of the early reports have, have come out and have actually told us that sex workers are still being criminalized, now not as um, perpetrators of a crime, but actually as witnesses to a crime. So this context of criminalization affects sex workers, whether they themselves are criminalized or the buyers are criminalized. And this is kind of a, perhaps for some, a surprise finding, perhaps not for, for everybody, but it tells us that even when buyers themselves are criminalized, we still have work to do to make sure that sex workers have access to justice. We cannot assume that police are now not going to harass or perpetrate um, violence against this population. Yes, great point. Thank you, Derek. Um, NSWP indeed has um, evidence and um, some of the reports that, that have come out very specifically um, in Sweden, but in a couple of other settings as well. So those are important to take a look at. Legalization. I want to give you a couple of points on this as well. Um, of course, sex work is legal in some settings under very specified conditions. Oftentimes, the sort of knee-jerk reaction to the problem of criminalization is legalization, and yet it's important for us to know that these legal settings often very restrictive, often discriminatory, and often reinforced with criminal law um, may require very costly registration or mandatory health exams. And of course, as a result, many sex workers simply operate outside the system. Also important to remember is that this context doesn't prevent violence and it does not assure access to justice. We've seen a lot of implementation issues with this as well. For example, where sex work is um, legal in very specific tolerance zones, um, when these are poorly specified because of reluctance to, to really establish these, this actually enables abuse and arrest. So proceed with caution and don't make assumptions about access to justice or ability to prevent HIV, even in these legalized contexts. Finally, I really want to highlight a piece that is not always talked about in these dialogues, and that is the GBV policy context. Part of the problem that we see around access to support services for sex workers for violence is that they're not always addressed. Sex workers are not always addressed in violence against women policy frameworks. This is true at the national level. It's true internationally when we look at CEDAW as well. So, for example, I'll go to talk with various um, ministries of health and and um, and family welfare, and we'll ask them, well, how are sex? You know, is there are there any protections for sex workers? Are your services open to sex workers? Whether you've got rape crisis or um, domestic violence shelter programs, and often um, these services really haven't been expanded. There's been no effort to really explicitly respond to sex workers for these services, despite the high prevalence of violence in this population. So this is. And that evidence is new, uh, but this is really an important area for policy reform, is getting sex workers and their needs very much integrated in GBV policy. Uh, this will allow access to justice. It will allow access to health care, including the STI testing and the emergency contraception that is needed for victims of violence when they present for care. So there's work to be done here as well, and I, I really want to highlight that. So, um, and I know there's a lot of questions coming in on the chat board here, um, so I'm going to wrap up here so that we can have some dialogue. Um, so hopefully, as a result of just the past, you know, 30 or 40 minutes here, we've seen that sex workers are at very high risk for violence. This contributes to HIV risk as well as other domains of poor health. Some of our prevention and intervention efforts um, are in the very earliest stages. We've got a lot of promising practices that suggest our ability to do this well. Um, there's a lot of work remaining in terms of evaluation, um, operations research, scale up, implementation issues to figure out how to do this well, what can we change through some of these interventions, and what else needs to be done. Again, mindful of the policy context in which we're really working. I reviewed the criminalization and the legalization as well. Um, and I want people to think about the practices in the context of the policy environment, in part because I think it's, it's been easy for us historically to say, well, this population is criminalized, there's nothing that we can do about this. But the momentum that we have through STRIVE, 
um, that we're building through our networks, that we're building through human rights responses around all of this is telling us that, that we can't wait for the policy to change. We've got to be operating, even in these criminalized environments, to advocate for justice and safety and health for this population. We can do that, um, and we will do that, and you all are very much part of that, um, part of that response. Um, so I'll just put up my little stay in touch slide here, and then we can have some discussion as well. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, that was a brilliant talk, really, really good. And there's, there's generated a lot of um, questions. Um, but if we start with the questions that have come in on the chat, we had one from Brent Wolf, and he was asking, what are you adjusting for? I think that was related to one of your earliest, very early slides. It was looking at the odds ratio of, of STI in, in, amongst women who had experienced violence compared to those who hadn't experienced violence, if I can remember correctly. So we looked carefully at confounders um, on this, um, including, you know, all of the demogra you know, demographic characteristics, length of time in sex work, number of clients that people would see on a given basis. Um, and we adjusted for – I should have it on this slide because I don't have it in front of me and I don't want to misspeak. But we did look – we looked at all of the things that we thought could potentially confound this because we wanted to really get this as pure as possible, right? We, we didn't want this to just simply be a function um, of something like, you know, people that are experiencing violence and, and also STI are simply, you know, both more likely to have been in sex work for longer duration. So we did do a pretty thorough analysis there. And similarly for the next slide, um, where we're looking at, again, this relationship of um, sexual violence and physical violence to um, HIV infection. I don't know if you had something specific you were wondering about, um, Brent. Let me just take a look at the chat. No, he's saying that that was just, just general interest was what he was thinking of there. Okay, so I think that you have answered his question. And Brent, if you're interested in further, you could look up Michelle, the references that Michelle provides on those two slides. Um, then we'll move on to Naira's um, question. Excuse me, everyone, if I'm pronouncing people's names incorrectly as well. I apologize. Um, but she asked, um, is the situation different when purchasing sex is considered illegal as opposed to providing services for listing? Yeah, so this is a really interesting issue. Um, most of the estimates that I've reviewed, our own work as well as um, other, other settings, because the dominant response to sex work on a policy level is criminalization, it's actually really difficult to compare policy environments. There are a couple of examples where um, sex work is legalized or even decriminalized, um, but being able to do, you know, th and this is a function of where we are in this research trajectory, too, is that, you know, this work is just starting to come out in the past eight, seven or eight years, I would say, and so the measurements are often different across studies, the outcomes are different across studies, the recruitment methods are different across studies, true in many fields, right? Um, but our ability to do kind of meta-analyses and, and also multi-level analyses where we're looking across policy contexts um, is, 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 has been limited so far in part because of where the research is and then also because there are so few places where we can get a comparison group um, in terms of a, a decriminalized or a legalized context. So we are, in a sense, comparing apples and oranges often, um, and most of the work has come out of uh, – most of the work, indeed, has come out of criminalized contexts. That said, some of the um, – some of the reports um, and some of the specific studies that have been done in more legalized settings um, does speak to an inability to access justice. I mean, here's an example from Turkey where uh, we saw incredibly high levels of abuse. Um, there was a policy response that involved police being stationed at sex work venues, um, and those police were, you know, theoretically there to protect against violence, um, but – or perhaps to monitor the sex work situation as an ulterior motive, who knows. Um, but they were actually – they were allowing abuse to occur without intervening, and they were indeed also perpetrating abuse. 
many of these stories like this one, um, small scale study, a uh, little bit anecdotal um, in terms of the evidence level, but this is why we're concerned about police violence and police impunity, even where sex work is quote unquote criminalized. This is why the social context matters so much. It's one thing to change the law. It's another thing to change practice. It's another thing to change people's perceptions about who is valuable and who is deserving of protection versus who is not. Okay, that was really interesting. Um, I am just looking now at um, the other questions that have come in. We've had um, um, a couple from Robert, Robin Dayton. Um, she asked, do you see big differences with male and transgender sex workers versus female sex workers? And she then go, goes on to qualify in terms of experiences of violence. Yeah, great question. And thank you so much for raising that. Um, one very, so I'll say the, the, the dominant um, work that has been done so far around violence in this population has been female sex workers. There are a couple of examples um, around male and transgender sex workers that have started to come out, um, and this is true in the research and it's true in the practice field as well. One of the reviews that USAID did recently reviewed um, tools and tools and sort of practices for uh, violence prevention for, for key populations. And I think they found, I used to have it on a slide and I think I may have cut that for a space and time, um, but they found hundreds of examples for sex workers and, you know, two for um, male sex workers or transgender. So, so there's been um, just really uh, the, the response for MSM and for transgender populations in general has lagged behind a little bit when we're thinking about violence, and that's definitely true for uh, on MSM and transgender who also trade sex. So we've done al almost, I mean, we're, we see some documentation, we see some human rights reports, we know that these issues are out there. Um, I will say, anecdotally, um, the nature of violence is a little bit different, uh, it is what it seems. Um, we, we don't have quite enough information to say for certain, um, but I will say that the discrimination issues um, are really, really dominant. The harassment issues are really, 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 really dominant in those populations. Um, and often that is the main thing that people are trying to work against um, through program and practice. Um, the levels of physical and sexual violence, I'm not, I'm not sure where they are. Um, they, they may be comparable, they may be lower with, with discrimination rising to the top and harassment rising to the top. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area and I think we have to be real careful about, you know, we wouldn't assume that what we've learned from women would in turn be true for um, MSM, male sex workers, um, or transgender sex workers. So thanks, thanks a lot for raising that. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, there seems to be a couple of questions or comments around the Nordic model. Um, I'm mindful also of time. We, we're going to need to wrap this, this, this all up in about nine minutes. So I wondered if you, I'll just talk about the Nordic model ones, and then there's some other questions that have come through as well. Um, Derek um, say, says NSWP has plenty of, of evidence on the failure of the Nordic model. And Anna Forbes adds in, it is my understanding that in countries employing Nordic model, the sex workers are having to work in more and more remote areas, industrial parts, etc., because clients are afraid of being seen and arrested. This reportedly increases the risk of violence because it's unlikely to be seen or observed. This is something you've also heard about. Yes, absolutely. Anytime, whether you're criminalizing clients or, um, or, or sex workers themselves, this is where you see people um, going into the shadows, becoming a little bit more isolated to avoid police detection. And in doing so, they incur risk for violence. Um, and you're taking them away from their natural support systems, if they exist at all. Um, and so that's one of the main critiques, I would say, of, you know, as, as Eric is raising, one of the main critiques of the Nordic model is that um, because there's still a criminalization aspect to it, we are undermining the, <clears throat> the natural networks that sex workers may have and the natural practices they may have for prevention of violence. Then there was um, a couple of questions, I think, around interventions here from Naira. Um, there was, she asked a question about, we know very little about IPV and the nature of partner relationships and violence with partners. And she says, other than Carlton, I can't think of anything else that doesn't look at occupational violence. Can you tell us a little bit more about IPV in this population? And then she also then goes on to ask about if you know of any interventions with brothel-based sex workers. 
Yeah, great question. Um, I think where we are with IPV um, is re really very interesting for sex workers. Some of the evidence suggests that sex worker, um, that, that uh, intimate par partners are sort of um, dominant perpetrator or sort of on par perhaps with clients in terms of the extent of perpetration. Other evidence, and it, it may vary by setting, um, other evidence suggests that it's really, really the clients that uh, we need to be intervening with in terms of violence prevention. So that varies a little bit by setting. Um, and it's not clear, one of the big concerns, of course, is that, you know, it's not clear whether or not our IPV prevention work can be translated directly to sex workers. Do we need to do some other work? And one of the questions that I have is, you know, are the same women that are experiencing partner violence also subject to this other, you know, police or, or client violence? So in terms of interventions, we're really, I would say, at the earliest stages, in part because we're still trying to pinpoint the problem. We're still trying to really get our heads around who are the main perpetrators, how is this happening for women, and also what their needs are. Um, we haven't done a lot um, in terms of identifying their needs. We can I obviously come up with our own needs that we see from the data that we have, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done around that. The brothel context is very interesting. Um, in some sense, when you think about an occupational health frame, um, you can perhaps get into brothels. You can perhaps get in with um, prevention messaging, and, and a lot of programs have been successful in doing that around HIV. The thing to remember is that not all brothels or venues are created equally. And the ones that we're probably most worried about are the ones that we may not have access to. And so that's the other, that's the challenge, I think, um, of doing work in those settings. However, you know, you have a captive audience. Um, if you can get in the door uh, for prevention, and that is certainly a place where you may be able to capitalize on some sort of social cohesion or some sort of workplace environment context um, to really create some change. Yeah, and just to let people know, people may know that Strive is um, is, is one one of the Strive interventions is a randomised control trial in South India, which is aiming to to intervene with um, IPV against female sex workers. Um, and I was just thinking about the brothel-based um, interventions. I think that that formed some of the Calcutta Calcutta um, interventions, the community mobilisation. Although I'm not sure how much of that was targeted against violence. One more point that I just want to raise, and thank you, Brent Wolf, for raising this. Um, and this is around the criteria of um, U.S. government funding and not advocating for um, the legalization of sex work. And this was um, this was introduced with PEPFAR in 2002, the Anti-Prostitution Loyalty Oath, the APLO. Um, and this required um, organizations to state that they were not going to advocate for legalization in order to be eligible for funding. Some nations chose not to um, um, adhere to that, uh, most notably the case of Brazil. Um, so one thing that's very exciting is that that was actually struck down um, in 2014 um, as unconstitutional. And the extent to which that is integrated into practice um, really remains unclear. Um, so that had been, just to be clear, that had been a real barrier um, in terms of getting support and, and allowing, you know, policy and allowing resources to move around this. That had been really a barrier. Um, the policy climate should be changing around that um, as a result of that um, 2014 decision. However, not fast enough, right? None of this is happening fast enough for us, for those of us that are trying to do this work. Um, but when we think about the policy context, that has been historically something that has been very, very problematic. So thank you for raising that. Okay. So this is another interventions question now, Michelle. This, again, this one comes from Prakash. And he asks, can you show any examples of integrating interventions on violence against female sex workers into the mainstream violence against women programs? Are there any specific examples with influencing policy in this regard? Great question. Great question. And I wish I could say that I have some examples of that. <laughs> I don't know that I do, um, other than, you know, the advocacy that, you know, myself and others are doing around trying to really engage um, rape crisis programs, partner violence programs um, in this dialogue. Um, a one of the big issues is um, historically sort of a discomfort with the issue of sex work and a feeling like we're not we're not ready to handle this. Should I tell her to get out of sex work? 
that what I need to be telling her? That's what we often hear from rape crisis programs. They don't always say it in those words, but that's the that's kind of where it's coming from. And so sharing sort of a harm reduction model with these organizations and trying to help them shape their practice is really, really, really important. Um, I don't know that it's being done on any kind of larger policy level yet, but in terms of advocacy, some, in terms of something that we can be doing to improve things from a practice and a policy standpoint, that's absolutely um, an important area. I'm not aware of anything that has been done on a large scale of yet. Okay. But those conversations take time, right? I mean, it takes time and it takes some relationship building to help people see what the needs are and help people see what the unmet needs are to really start to shape that. Um, and so I am heartened by things like, um, gosh, even having panels on sex work at, you know, GBV kinds of events or conferences. Um, that's the first step in sort of expanding this dialogue. And so we can all be part of that change. Okay, we'll take a couple more of these questions that have come in. We've had one from Pippa. She says, thanks for an excellent presentation. You talked about the really concerning health harms of criminalization. I wonder if you could also say something about how you feel this is affected by discourses framing all sex work as violence against women and the anti-harm reduction approach emerging in context of partial criminalization. For example, Jay Levy's work in Sweden. Yeah, great question. Great question. I think... This is one of the real challenges, right? It's a real challenge for us when all sex work is framed as um, as violence against women because that doesn't allow for any any room for sort of a harm reduction model, and it dictates that the, the necessary response is to get women out of sex work. Um, and so that frame, that policy frame is really a, a very challenging one when we're thinking about a harm reduction framework. Um, and and often, you know, people need a little bit of education around this um, in terms of the, the reasons and the variety of reasons for which women or men or anybody is actually entering sex work. Um, one of the things that concerns me the most is that I think it really takes the voice away. It takes a, an empowerment away from people to say their own experience, right? I mean, we, you know, in the violence movement, we we allow people to come to their own conclusions, right? We don't tell people, oh, you've been raped after they tell us, you know, their experiences. That's not sort of a best practice, right? And so it's pretty presumptuous of us to, to, to look at all sex workers and say, you know, you're experiencing violence. Um, on a more practical level, uh, it's created a real problem, and it's actually, I'm really glad that you raised this because um, models like that, if they're truly in practice, are preventing women from, from getting rape crisis support or from getting domestic violence shelter because there is a perception and often a reality that in order to get those services, they're going to have to say or act like or actually give up, you know, give up sex work, and that may well be their livelihood. Um, so, so there is a real tension there, um, and one that we, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm an epidemiologist by training, you know, so that some of the evidence around this really comes into play, and this, the evidence tells us that some women tell us that they've been trafficked or um, forced or Fraud, fraudulently entering sex work, and other women tell us that this was the only way they had to meet their um, financial financial needs. And so we've got to really be responsive to that. We have to listen to the voices of people that are actually involved in this, and use that as a basis for making making policy decisions. Um, it's very it's very compelling for many people to feel like, oh, we've got to save these women, and 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 sort of comes from this very patriarchal um, kind of framework, and that's something we need to be real cautious about. And again, just allow that evidence to inform the dialogue. Um, I think maybe, Michelle, we'll take one more question. Um, another one from Pippa, um, and this will be the final question that we'll, we'll, um, to wrap up the session. Um, she says, again, thanks for a really excellent presentation. You stressed that most countries criminalize all or some aspects of some sex work, and that the research re reflects this focus. But I wonder if you could say something about work on the potential and observed health impacts of de decriminalization. E.G. Julian Abel's work in New Zealand, Kate Shannon and colleagues' work modeling the possible impact of decriminalization on HIV incidents. Yeah, great. Thank you. 
That's a great question. Right. So um, <clears throat> New Zealand is is probably the best best example of decriminalization. Um, and and some of the evidence that has come out there um, has suggested that people are indeed more able to access health services under climates of de decriminalization, and so that's really exciting. Um, one of the things to sort of think about is um, um, access to police reporting, experiences of violence have generally decreased. We still see it persisting, um, although to a lesser degree. So, you know, a policy fix at that level is very potent, um, and, you know, of course, more, you always need to make sure that sort of the practice catches up with really the policy and kind of how it's intended. So that's a piece to, to think about there, but that has been um, really the example that has held up uh, around decriminalization. So it's a good one for us to, to learn some lessons from. Um, and then, of course, Kate Shannon's work around really modeling the impact of decriminalization, of course, because this policy context frames and shapes so many other aspects of risk and access to care and services, um, it's very potent. Um, and so when we look at modeling examples around decriminalizing and HIV incidents for this population, it's actually really amazing um, and it's really potent when we think about how many infections could be averted in, in these contexts of um, policy change. So that is, that is absolutely a wonderful example um, and telling us a lot about really what is the impact on HIV outcomes um, as well as violence when we think about the policy context. Um, and that, for people that are interested, um, came out in um, a, a special issue of The Lancet that was released at the 2014 AIDS conference um, and is, I believe, available for free um, and I believe is linked as part of the Strive um, presentations to this, to this particular presentation. Our human rights article appeared in that special issue as well. Um, and then there are other pieces that are around um, community mobilization specifically. It's a wonderful issue to take a look at if you're working with sex workers around structural determinants um, and is, is a great, a really a great resource. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much, Michelle. That has been a wonderful presentation. I'm hoping that participants have, had, have gained a lot from this. And that's been echoed by um, some of the comments that are coming through. Thank you for such an excellent presentation.